1942. History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Welcome to Season 2 of Beyond Barbarossa, the first and still the only English-language podcast in the world to focus on the Eastern Front of World War II. I'm Scott Burry, podcasting to you from the Redbeard Studio on traditional Anishinaabe Algonquin territory, also known as Ottawa, Canada. And today I'm assisted by the stalwart golden doodle, Daisy. Thanks for coming back for Season 2. Starting with this episode, we move into the second full year of the War on the Eastern Front. As Season 1 established, we'll be tracking the history of the war chronologically with an 81-year lag. See, this podcast started on 22nd June 2022, the 81st anniversary of the launch of Operation Barbarossa, Germany's attack on the USSR, and the biggest land invasion in history. And episodes continue to track the history through the year. For example, the Battle of Smolensk in July, Operation Typhoon in the fall, the Battle of Moscow in December, up to June's episodes on the capture of Sebastopol in June and early July 1942. Episode 26, which dropped in May, was about the lead-up to Germany's big push for the summer of 1942. Foul Blau, or Case Blue, or Operation Blue. So, if you haven't heard that episode, um, why don't you go back to it and um, review it or refresh it in your mind. I'll wait. Now, before we get any further, I just want to remind you that you can support this podcast through Patreon. Just find it on patreon.com slash beyondbarbarossa. So let's just recap the last couple of narrative episodes where I described that lead up to uh, the summer of 1942 and the planning for the operations by the Germans. Hitler in the winter or spring of 1942, decided that Moscow was no longer the primary objective of the war against the USSR, at least for the time being. Summer 1942's goal would be the oil fields of Baku, Grozny, and Maikop in the Caucasian steppe. See map one on the website for this episode so that you have an idea of where these places are. Now, according to Count Galeazzo Siano, Italy's Minister of Foreign Affairs during the war, Hitler said to his generals, quote, If I do not get the oil of Markop and Grozny, then I must end this war. End quote. See, oil for fuel and lubricants for the mechanized armies was a major concern for Germany, as well as for every mechanized army at this time. As well as were all the supplies on these ever-extending fronts of the German army, thousands of miles from their sources. For example, Germany's only source of oil at this point was Romania, and their Ploisty oil fields were being bombed regularly by the Red Air Force. Northern Africa and its oil resources was still in contention with intense fighting the uh, British and soon American forces there. So the only sort of logical or reasonable source of oil was that from southern Russia. To deal with the challenges and these goals, the German general staff drew up Case Blue, an operation to seize those oil resources. This meant seizing all the territory between the Black and Caspian Seas from the Volga River in the north all the way to the northern slopes of the Caucasus Mountains. Take a look at Map 2 on the website to see just how insanely ambitious this is. The distance from Rostov-on-Don, so where the Don River 
flows into the Sea of Azov, kind of the extent of the German advance in the spring of 1942, to Grozny, their goal, is 1,282 kilometers, or about 800 miles. Now, by comparison, to go from Brest, Belarus, where the Germans began Operation Barbarossa the year earlier, to their original goal of Moscow was 1,051 kilometers, or a little over 600 miles. You see? Quite a difference. Hitler's plan, then, for summer 1942 was to go farther than he had planned in summer 1941, which didn't work out, as well as start a week later in the year when, you know, the common thinking was what stalled the Germans in 1941 was the arrival of winter. Didn't alarm bells go off anywhere in Berlin during this planning phase? Oh, I guess they were drowned out by the air raid sirens. Anyway, as described in the last narrative episodes of Season 1, the Germans led up to the launch of File Blau with a number of what we now call shaping operations. This included cutting off a Soviet salient at Barankovo in southeastern Ukraine, as covered in Episode 26. In this, the Germans captured 240,000 soldiers and about 2,000 field guns and tanks. Marshal Semyon Timoshenko, the commander of the Southern Front, and Nikita Khrushchev, the political commissar of Ukraine, were demoted. Georgi Zhukov took Timoshenko's place as deputy supreme commander under Stalin. In the north, Operation Flaschenhals, or Bottleneck, an attempt to surround Leningrad and link up with the Finns on either side of Lake Ladoga, and an attempted Soviet counterattack to relieve the city resulted in 95,000 Soviet casualties. Then the Germans completed their capture of the whole Crimean Peninsula. First, the commander in the area, Manstein, counterattacked a Soviet amphibious operation at Kerch, capturing and destroying three Red Armies in the process. Then he turned his full attention, as well as the biggest cannons ever made, on the Black Sea Fleet's base at Sevastopol. Grinding, brutal fighting eventually gave the Germans the devastated city by early July. On 2nd July... The Germans launched Operation Feuerzauber, or Magic Fire. See, the Germans continued to have cool names for operations. So this happened west of Moscow and drove the Soviets back, shortening the Germans' defensive line. Now, remember, Hitler had decided that Moscow was not the objective for this summer. However, Stalin and the Stavka were convinced Moscow was. This operation... Fewer's Albert, Magic Fire, as well as continual misinformation leaks, convinced the Stavka that Moscow continued to be the, the objective. Finally, there was the Second Battle of Rostov. On 19th July, the German 17th Army and 1st Panzer Army seized bridgeheads across the Don River, as well as a dike south of the city. This prevented the Red Army from flooding the area, forming a barrier against the Germans. It would be a very effective uh, tactic, as shown when the Russians successfully destroyed the Kakovka Dam in Ukraine in 2023, forming a barrier against Ukrainian advance across the Dnipro River. But anyway, the, the Russians were not able to do that in, um, in, 20, in 1942, Thus, the Germans were able to cross the Don River, and the roads south into the Caucasian steppe were wide open. And now, before we get to Thalblau and that advance into the Caucasian steppe, it's time for our regular feature, What's Happening Elsewhere in the War? July 1942. 
the high point for the Axis powers around the world. In Europe, the Axis, its puppets, clients, and allies hold almost all of Europe, from the Atlantic to the Don River, except for Portugal, which was nominally neutral, and Switzerland. Norway was occupied by the Germans. Sweden, officially neutral, but more leaning toward Germany than the Allies. Finland was aligned with, with Germany, mostly because it had been attacked by the USSR. In the Pacific, the Japanese Empire reached its greatest extent, even though it had been beaten at the Battle of Midway in June 1942. Their zone of control or influence reached halfway across the Pacific, stretching from the Aleutian Islands in the north, south of the Solomon Islands east of Australia, and including the Netherlands Antilles, now known as Indonesia, Burma, and half of Papua New Guinea. So just for a bit of uh, day by day, on the 3rd of June, Imperial Japanese forces consolidated their hold on Guadalcanal and, far to the north, launched air raids in the Aleutian Islands. On July 4th, the U.S. Army Air Force flew its first missions in Europe. On the 11th, there was a stalemate at El Alamein in northern Africa because Rommel, the Desert Fox, and his Africa Corps had run out of ammunition and were waiting for a resupply. On July 19th, the second happy time came to an end as uh, German Grand Admiral Karl Donitz pulled the U-boats back from the U.S. eastern seaboard because of the more effective convoy system to protect those uh, Allied ships against the prowling wolf packs. On the 20th, Australian forces began their rear guard action on the Kolkata Trail in New Guinea. On July 22nd, the Germans opened the Treblinka extermination camp in Poland. On the 26th, the first battle of El Alamein, where the British tried to counterattack and drive Rommel's forces back, ended with a British failure. On the 27th, the RAF, the Royal Air Force, hit Hamburg with a heavy air raid using incendiary bombs. Two days later, on 29th July, the Japanese captured Kokoda in New Guinea, capturing thousands of Australians. On August 5th, so I'm getting a little bit ahead of the story, but this is important for the context, Operation Watchtower began. This is where American forces invaded Guadalcanal, Tulagi, and Tenambogo in the Solomon Islands, which are, as I said, if you look at a map, they're in a global scale, not that far east of Australia itself. On the 8th, there is a naval battle of the Savo Island in the Solomon Islands. Here, the U.S. lost three cruisers and the Australian Navy lost one, while the Japanese suffered only light damage. It's considered one of the worst defeats in U.S. naval history. On August 12th, Churchill met Stalin in Moscow and had to tell him there would be no second front in Europe in 1942, much to Stalin's displeasure. However, the land lease was going strong. On the 17th of August, the U.S. Air Force uh, B-17 bombers, heavy bombers, blew their first missions over Europe. Then came on the 19th of August, and you history buffs will know this one well, Operation Jubilee, disastrous raid by mostly Canadian troops with British commandos and U.S. Rangers on Dieppe, a port on the English Channel coast of France. Of the 6,068 men involved in the landing, about 5,000 of them Canadian, 3,623 were killed, wounded, or captured. In addition, the RAF lost 16 aircraft and their crews. The Royal Canadian Air Force lost 13. There were losses of ships and tanks as well. German casualties and losses were negligible. This raid showed the Allies, including Stalin, they were not yet ready for a big amphibious assault on Hitler's fortress Europe. Not in 1942, at any rate. Now, time to zoom in again on the Eastern Front. 
Now remember, as of July, Stalin still believed that the Germans' true target for this summer remained to be Moscow, while Hitler's real goal is the Caucasus and its rich resources of oil and others. Even when Major Joachim Reichenau, a staff officer with the plans for Case Blue in his briefcase, was shot down behind Soviet lines and captured, Stalin believed that the documents he carried were fake. In many ways, the summer of 42 is shaping up to be a, not a repeat, but a replay of the summer of 1941. Remember that the Soviet leadership got intelligence from a number of sources that Germany was going to attack in June 1941. One spy even gave the day, 22nd June. Stalin didn't believe it then either. History doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. So, let's take a short break, and when we come back, we'll travel into the broad, dry, and very hot Caucasian steppe. This episode is brought to you by the Eastern Front Trilogy, the true story of a Canadian man, Maurice Burry, drafted into the Soviet Red Army in 1941, just in time to be thrown between the jaws of the USSR and Nazi Germany at the launch of the greatest land invasion in history, the monstrous war called Operation Barbarossa. It comes in three volumes, Army of War and Souls, Under the Nazi Heel, and Walking Out of War. The Eastern Front Trilogy is the story of the largest and deadliest side of the Second World War, seen through the eyes of a man who was there from the earliest days in 1941, through Germany's grinding occupation of Ukraine, and finally, to the savage end of the war in Berlin. You can find three individual volumes as ebooks exclusively on Amazon, or purchase a three volume complete paperback on any online book retailer or at your local bookstore. To learn more about the Eastern Front Trilogy, visit scottburyauthor.com. Did you know that the cappuccino was invented by a Ukrainian? Or that many first names, like Philip and Agatha, were brought to Western Europe by Ukrainian princesses? Or that a Ukrainian was the first female given the rank of officer in a modern army? Well, if you didn't, and even if you did, you can learn more about my podcast, Wandering the Edge, a podcast about Ukrainian history with a spot of travel. And all in English. And if you like Beyond Barbarossa as much as I do, because, well, it makes my life a whole lot easier since I don't have to do any episodes deep diving into the Eastern Front of the Second World War, please take a listen to Wandering the Edge for a deep dive into Ukrainian history, culture, and traditions. Find out more on wanderingtheedge.net. And now let's get back to Scott exploring and explaining the Eastern Front of the Second World War. Thanks for coming back. Now we'll take a look at the Germans' drive into the Caucasus in the summer of 1942. Case Blue, Foul Blau, Operation Blue divided von Bock's Army Group South into two. Army Groups A and B. So while von Bock retained overall command of Army Group South, uh, Army Group A 
would be commanded by General Kleist, while B would be commanded by General von Weeks. Army Group A then would carry out Operation Edelweiss, the drive to capture the Caucasian oil fields. Army Group B would continue east toward the city of Stalingrad at the Great Bend, the last Great Bend of the Volga River, before it goes on its more or less straight southeast course toward the Caspian Sea. Case Blue itself, the operation, was divided into three phases. Phase 1 sent the German 2nd Army under General von Weeks, as well as Hermann Hott's 4th Panzer Army, supported by the 2nd Hungarian Army, to capture Voronezh, a city east of Kursk, between the great rivers Don and Volga. After taking the city, they would protect the north or left flank of the next part of the operation, the 6th Army under Paulus, driving towards Stalingrad at the last great bend of, of the Volga. The Germans struck east on the 28th of June, smashing through three Red Armies, and they reached Voronezh by the 6th of July and held the western bank of the Voronezh River. Stavka, in response, sent two more armies, the 6th and 60th, to reinforce those uh, three armies that had been broken through, but they could not halt the German advance. This allowed the Germans to move to step two. The 6th Army and the 4th Panzer Army would encircle Soviet forces in the bend of the Don River, the point where it reaches closest toward the Volga before uh, sort of doubling back to the southwest and the Sea of Azov. Having destroyed and captured whatever Red Army forces were left, the 6th Army was to then proceed towards Stalingrad in Operation Fischreicher, or Heron. Now, you have to understand something really important here. Even at this point, in July 1942, capturing Stalingrad was not in the Germans' plans. The plan was to get close enough to the city to put it within artillery and bomber range. This would prevent the Soviets from bringing Lend-Lease supplies up the Volga from Iran across the Caspian Sea. It would also keep that oil from Baku on the Caspian from reaching Moscow and the uh, uh, sorry, Soviet resupply sources. Oil that is as vital to the Soviet war effort as to the Germans. General Ewald von Kleist, commander of Army Group A, said, quote, The capture of Stalingrad was subsidiary to the main aim. It was only of importance as a convenient place, in the bottleneck between the Don and the Volga, where we could block an attack on our flank by Russian forces coming from the east. At the start, Stalingrad was no more than a name on a map to us. Kleist went on to say, Hitler said that we must capture the oil fields by the autumn because Germany could not continue the war without them. When I pointed out the risks of leaving such a long flank exposed, he said he was going to draw out Romania, Hungary, and Italy for troops to cover it. I warned him, and so did others, that it was rash to rely on such troops, but he would not listen. End quote. Although capturing Stalingrad was not part of the plan, the Soviets did not know this. Stavka sent four armies, organized into the Stalingrad front, to defend the city. And, well, I guess that's a textbook example of escalation. The Battle of Stalingrad is a subject for a future episode. Don't worry, we'll get there. What was part of the Germans' plan was that the 4th Panzer Army would turn south to join Army Group A on the drive toward the Caucasus oil fields, Maykop and Grozny. But here's where summer 1942 once again rhymes with summer 1941. As the plan is unfolding, Hitler decides to change it. He diverted half the panzers at Voronezh, those forces holding that right bank of the river but not taking the whole city, south to the Caucasus to join Army Group A. 
This left the forces at Voronezh unable to take the city. Still, everything else seemed to be going well. Army Group A captured or recaptured Rostov on Dawn on 23rd July. Their next assignment, Maikop and Grozny, where the oil was. Meanwhile, Hitler ordered the 6th Army to capture Stalingrad. The 4th Romanian Army would protect the f- their flanks along the Don River. The 24th Panzer Corps under Hermann Hott, which had been racing south, was ordered to turn around again to join the assault on Stalingrad. Meanwhile, Manstein's 11th Army, which had just destroyed Sevastopol and occupied all of the Crimean Peninsula, was sent north for a new offensive on Leningrad. We'll look at that separately in a different episode. But what this all means is that instead of concentrating forces, Hitler is spreading them out. In response to the sweeping advances by the Germans, which echo the advances of summer 1941, the Stavka issued a chilling order, the Shagu Nazad, not one step back. Quote, Panic mongers and cowards must be destroyed on the spot. The retreat mentality must be decisively eliminated. Army commanders who have allowed the voluntary abandonment of positions must be removed and sent for immediate trial by military tribunal. End quote. The Red Army set up blocking groups, soldiers whose job it was to shoot and kill anyone who ran from the fighting. This order led to some grotesque excesses. For example, there's the story of Lieutenant Alexander Obodov, a commander of a mortar company who had just arrived at the front. One of his men had just deserted, even before Obodov had met him. The unfortunate officer was dragged before a tribunal, and summarily shot by two NKVD agents. Now, looking at the Caucasus, from Rostov, Army Group A swept south across the Caucasian steppe, taking Maikop on 10th of August, Krasnodar on the 12th, Mozdok on the 23rd, and on the 11th of September, always an auspicious day, the port of Novorossiysk. After the fall of Sevastopol, the USSR's main and last remaining major port on the Black Sea. See Map 3 on the webpage to get an idea of where all these places are. So, the Germans had captured Maikop the oil center. Hooray, we have oil now and we can keep going. But by the time they got there, the Red Army had destroyed the oil stores and fields. So sorry, Nazis, no oil for you. On the 12th of August, the day the Germans captured Krasnodar, mounted troops climbed the highest peak in the Caucasus range, Mount Elbrus, and planted the Nazi flag. Nazis love their flags and symbols. Too bad the meaning behind them is so evil. By this time, the German supply lines had been stretched beyond the breaking point. They were well past railheads. Oil trucks themselves ran out of fuel on the way to the front, and oil sometimes had to be brought up on camels. More units were diverted to the increasing fighting at Stalingrad, including the air cover from the southern push. This allowed the Red Air Force operating in the south to harass the Germans more or less at will. Soviet resistance was getting stiffer as local troops defending their homeland and Georgian mountain troops being especially effective. All this led to the advance stalling by the end of August. There was still some fighting, but the Germans didn't get farther than the northern slopes of the Caucasus Mountains, and they certainly didn't get the oil fields. Now it's time to take a quick look at the third part of Foul Blau, Operation Edelweiss, the drive toward Baku on the Caspian Sea. As the rest of Army Group A moved toward Maikop and Grozny, the 1st Panzer Army headed southeast toward Baku. They only made it to the slopes of the Caucasus as well, stopped by the Red Army and local forces, as well as those overextended supply lines. And if you take a look at a map or at Google Maps, 
you'll see that getting to Baku from Rostov on Don requires getting past at least some of the Caucasus Mountains. Very rugged territory. No wonder the operation failed. So, let's sum up. Starting in the winter and spring of 1942, the German general staff developed a long-range strategy and operational plan to achieve some clear objectives, the oil fields of the Caucasus and the Caspian Sea. This would solve a number of their big challenges in the war in the East. Enough resources. Not just oil and gas, which are the first on the list, but food as well. This was an ambitious plan, but at least it was clear. They did a lot of things right, at the beginning anyway. They carried out shaping operations that created some conditions to favor the operation. They finished the conquest of Crimea and moved the natural border up to the Don River. As they had in 1941, they built up overwhelming forces along a wide front, but it's essential to point out here that they did not have the numbers that they had in 1941. They didn't have three and a half million men ready to launch this operation as they had in 1941. They had lost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of men over the past year. Meanwhile, the Soviet high command, as in 1941, were fooled about the Germans' intentions. Then, when the operation began in July, or the end of June, 1942, the Germans swept aside the defenders and made huge, rapid advances, taking swathes of territory and city after city. Some of the people in the conquered territory initially welcomed the Germans as liberators. This soured quickly as the Germans looted everything they could and killed anyone who looked at them funny. And then, the German high command, that is, Hitler, started tinkering with the plan. Instead of concentrating forces, he diverted them in various directions, trying to accomplish several things at once. The operation, at least in terms of achieving the goal of the oil fields, failed. Just as in the previous year, Operation Barbarossa failed in its objectives of Moscow, Leningrad, and Kiev. History doesn't repeat. But it rhymes. And that's all for this week. Come back in two weeks when we look at the other branch of Case Blue, the advance on Stalingrad, at least the first part of it. Thank you for listening to Beyond Barbarossa, the podcast about the Eastern Front of the Second World War. For a better understanding of the progress of the war, please see the maps and photos on the website beyondbarbarossa.ca or beyondbarbarossa.podbean.com. You can also listen to the episode on my own website, writtenword.ca, and click on the podcast button in the banner. If you like this episode, please consider supporting it on Patreon. Supporters get bonus episodes on subjects like the invasion of Poland, the winter war with Finland, and next, Soviet Marshal Georgi Zhukov. Thanks to all who have already supported the podcast through Patreon. Until all Ukrainian refugees can return home safely, your financial support goes to charities that help Ukrainian refugees. If you like this episode, consider following Beyond Barbarossa on your preferred podcasting app. And I'd really appreciate a rating on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, or wherever you listen. That really helps spread the word to others interested in history. Have a question or a comment, a suggestion, a correction? Please reach out. And if you find I've made any errors, let me know. Just email me at contact at beyondbarbarossa.ca or through the Facebook Beyond Barbarossa page. And also, I'd like to get uh, your feedback. Do you think I should open up other social media accounts for this podcast, such as on Instagram or Twitter or the new Threads social medium. I'd love to hear your ideas, your thoughts on that. Original music was composed and recorded by Nicholas Burry. I'm Scott Burry. 
Until next episode, keep your paddles in the water. Slava Ukraina.